Well, thank you for having us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sidney Armani. I'm editor and publisher of CloudFundBeat. CloudFundBeat is an online magazine for cloud funding and cloud financing. Uh, we uh, publish in the uh, United States, Canada, UK, uh, Germany, France, and uh, uh, Italy. So crowdfunding is a very, very huge uh, phenomenon that is happening in the last couple of years. It's going to get explored this year, and we're honored to have this great panel here. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself from there? All right. Uh, well, you you did see me earlier, but I'm Trish Costello. I am the uh, CEO and founder of Portfolio, and we engage connected consumers uh, as investors around entrepreneurial companies that they believe in and uh, help them make those companies successful by bringing their robust social networks. Hi everybody, I'm Danae Ringelman. I'm founder of Indiegogo and we're now the largest global crowdfunding platform in the world in every country distributing millions of dollars every week to artists, entrepreneurs, causes, charities, pretty much you name it, we let you fund. Um, and um, that's it. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. I'm Robert Mitchell. I'm with Crowdfund Capital Advisors. Uh, we're an uh, advisor and consulting firm working on early stage finance, particularly debt, equity, and rewards based crowdfunding. Uh, right now, we're doing a lot of work with uh, governments, NGOs, uh, and various sort of multilateral organizations, helping them uh, create crowdfunding frameworks and, and ecosystems. Hi, I'm Nancy Hayes. I'm co-founder of Moolah Hoop. Our overarching goal is to address the disparity in funding available to women-owned businesses in the U.S. and to accelerate the growth of those businesses. And so we have uh, launched a, a site that uses crowdfunding and other elements to help address that issue. Hello, I'm Scott Orn. I work at Lighthouse Capital. We make loans to startups, which sounds like kind of like a crazy idea, uh, but it works. And then in my spare time, I'm actually co-founder of a nonprofit called Ben's Friends. We build patient support networks for people with rare diseases. We're actually the second largest on the internet, and I've actually done at least four or five Indiegogo campaigns. Every year we do an Indiegogo campaign to fund Ben's Friends. I met Indiegogo four years ago when we were just about out of money, and uh, every year they seem to solve that problem for us. That's great. Perfect. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I'm Kate O'Hara, and uh, basically have uh, a company right now called uh, Omniverse Media, and we are a startup. I've been a serial uh, investor, entrepreneur, um, you know, raising millions of dollars for various different types of companies across uh, different industries. Um, had a, uh, from the beginning, uh, OL company where it was about the size of a water bottle, and we raised uh, nine million to, and it ended up being 120 feet in the air. So um, big operations, different types of uh, alternative funding. I'm very passionate about um, basically looking at uh, contracts as far as uh, funding is concerned and, and using your sales and marketing. And you know, when you talk about <coughs> bootstrap, um, you can talk to me. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you uh, very much again. And uh, the, the subject is the alternative uh, option to the VC or venture capitals. Uh, let me start with you, Trish. Is anything such a thing of an alternative option to the VC? Yes, yes, absolutely. Besides the angels, I know you are. <laughs> yes, uh, well, you know, I, I think it's, it's interesting because a lot of people say, oh my God, equity crowdfunding, and I'd never do that. You know, you can't get money after it. You know, lawyers hate it. You can have all those people on the cap table. You know, those same issues were, were, were uh, brought up 15 years ago when angels started to be you know, really active. It's the same kind of thing now. It's just these changes are difficult and it causes some, some chaos, but we're going to work it through and this is going to enhance the whole ecosystem for entrepreneurs. Okay, well thank you. Dana, let me, you guys are doing a great job. Indigo goes brands everywhere and you know, we're grateful for that. You know, it's another great American brand. I traveled and everybody knows that mm -hmm. because of your ambassador and Salva. Uh, do you see that uh, uh, crowdfunding uh, or crowdfunding is a lot of, you know, you guys more in the equity, we're not much in equity, but you guys have planning to get to the equity. Are you guys, what do you see foresee this happening uh, for entrepreneurs out there that they bring product, somehow they sell, but they want to raise money for their company and continue mm -hmm. their, their company. Do you, do you see that it's going to happen for them? Yeah, well, first, thank you for saying that. Um, oh. I was definitely in the bootstrapping days <laughs> for many years. 
hustling. Before the word crowdfunding even existed, we were trying to create this industry. So um, it's nice to see it flourishing and us all sitting around the table talking about it. Um, yeah, I think when when I started Indiegogo, um, my, I got the idea you know, back in 2002 originally when I was trying to actually, I was working at, on Wall Street trying to help filmmakers raise money on the side and was failing because I didn't know the right people. And I recognized there was this huge inefficient access to capital for people that didn't have the right Rolodex or connections. Um, and I had an event where um, it really kind of came true that the, I realized the problem is that um, I did this event where it was a theater event and the whole audience wanted to turn the play into a full-blown production and the actors wanted to, but the investors just didn't know who I was and so they said no. And I realized that that was the moment where you had to put the hands back in the power back in the hands of the people to decide which ideas come to life, which was kind of the, the beginning of um, what became Indiegogo. Um, and so when we started Indiegogo, the original intention was to empower people to invest in whatever they wanted. And when I met my co-founders, they said, you need to use the internet. Yeah. <laughs> the most democratic tool out there. And I was like, we well, can't invest online because it's illegal. And the securities laws, I, I worked on Wall Street for seven years, I know that. Um, and so we kind of tried to navigate the laws a bit and realized that we were newbie entrepreneurs trying to prove both social fundraising, which at the time, again, the word crowdfunding didn't exist, so this concept was new and everybody was making fun of us. And we were trying to change the law, and so rather than do both at the same time, we said, let's just go prove social fundraising first. That's when we came up with the perks concept, mm -hmm. and that's now become the pillar of kind of the crowdfunding industry that a lot has flourished since and paved the way for us to even be talking about equity crowdfunding. Um, but our whole goal was to come back to equity eventually, because our mission is to empower people not just um, to fund what matters to them, wherever they are, but also however they'd like to fund it. And so um, philosophically, equity crowdfunding makes a ton of sense. Yes, it's returning back to our roots <laughs> from where the, it, it all began, but it's also um, it, people, uh, by saying things like it's, you know, it's too risky or it's not right for people, it's a very patronizing tone. Mm -hmm. And um, when I talk to everybody I know, my friends, my mother, my brother, all, everyone, they know what they know. And right now the law doesn't allow them to invest in what they know. And it's, in a way, it's a very patronizing kind of con paradigm that we live in. And so that's why I think it's great that equity crowdfunding is coming on. And I think it's uh, on the shoulders of platforms like Indiegogo and others to figure out the right user experience that's both safe uh, educates people to the point that they need to be educated to feel comfortable taking the risks that they're taking. And I think it's exciting because I think the platforms, like we've had now six years of experience trying to understand that in a, in a perks space paradigm, and now it's just a matter of taking those learnings and continuing to evolve in the equity um, paradigm. But I think it's possible and I think um, it's, it's inevitable. And yeah. It's just a matter of kind of getting through this Wild West period where there will be some people who mess up and fraud and and hopefully one platform's mistakes won't bring the whole industry down, but um, everyone will learn from it and hopefully we'll actually build a, a robust industry. Similar to e-commerce, when e-commerce first happened, there was fraud out the wazoo and um, that didn't stop the internet from becoming a great place to buy things online. So. Can I build on her thing just for one second? I mean, a lot of professional investors are watching what's happening on the crowdfunding platforms and then taking that as product market fit and then actually investing in the companies right away far earlier than they ever would have. So it's, I, I totally agree with your patronizing comment. Like, I think it is patronizing that people can't do this while, you know, venture capitalists or other investors are just sitting there, like, picking off the best companies. You know, they're doing the equity crowdfunding right now. Um, based on all the data that, that the crowdfunding platforms are generating, so why not let other people do? We call it spray and pray. Let me get to you, Robert. Uh, Robert, you, uh, Robert is with the uh, capital, the crowdfund capital advisors, and you guys, uh, your and partners, uh, Jason, Moody, and yourself, been involved with the Jobs Act, you know, or forefront, and you do more involvement with the uh, World Bank, you know, uh, around the world, and very novel things to do, and with another partner, Richard Swart, which is you know, Berkeley Institute, and mm -hmm. he gave me an inside word that uh, you, you, you guys, kind of, a, when you were in Berkeley, uh, and, uh, I said crowdfunding started from Berkeley, so let me say that I, so <laughs> let, me, let me know, what if we are at with this job act? You know, you, you have that inside, they write this report, your partners over here, what are we at with this job act? Is it gonna happen? Is it gonna 
with this, the way it's coming in, with the $1 million and you know, $40,000 for any entrepreneurs before they even start, what do we have with that? Well, the, the SEC has released draft rules uh, to, to regulate the market, all 585 pages worth, I think, uh, in the fall. And there's some, there's some really good provisions in there that we support, like uh, education for investors um, and uh, the ability to do <coughs> parallel offerings, uh, traditional what we call Title III crowdfunding offerings, uh, as well as Title II targeting accredited investors simultaneously. So there's some, some good things in those rules, but there's also uh, some, some, some troubling things uh, there as well that could really harm the industry. So, uh, my business partners and I are still involved in the process in Washington. Uh, they were just there a week before last, in fact, uh, trying to get more manageable final rules. Uh, some of the, the, the reporting requirements for uh, small entrepreneurs are prohibitively expensive and onerous, uh, as well as uh, some liability issues, some liability that's going to be placed on these platforms, uh, particularly the ones that aren't broker dealers. So there, there, there's some, some troubling aspects of it, there's some positive things, and we'll see where the final rules mm -hmm. shake out. And it, it, you know, probably be another several months. Does everybody know the title one, I mean, title yeah. two or title three is yeah. a, the room? Mm -hmm. you no, know, the title two is just basically, you know, they, they, you can solicit, and there's a lot of good things are happening. A lot of companies are advertising under the five or six rules. And the Title III is a basically full crowdfunding, which is where everybody waiting. That's mm -hmm. what they're talking about that. Let me start with you, Nancy. You, uh, what are your outlook? What do you see as crowdfunding evolving to be? Uh, well, we're great admirers of Indiegogo and the work done by the people who were responsible for helping the Jobs Act get through. And we saw the potential long-term impact of crowdfunding and what that's going to become in the future, and that it can impact all kinds of markets. And so we are really adapting it to I would say more a depth area. So women own business and particularly small business. And we're, we see great potential, even variations on the equity, because a lot of the kinds of businesses we work for are not gonna have the traditional equity exit. But they are gonna deliver great returns to investors over yeah. time, or to owners over time. And so we think that this is just the beginning of what will become just the way of doing business over time. And so that's why we're using it for small business and for women in particular because women are starting 30% of all businesses in the U.S., twice the rate of overall startups, yet remain very small, very undercapitalized, and are earning very little. Yet, women represent the economic strength of the family, as well as, in many cases, the country. And so that's kind of our goal, to help these businesses get to the next level, where later on they'll be knocking on the door of equity crowdfunding. Women are a great social networkers, and, so, and that's what's all about this crowdfunding and social networking has a great impact on the whole, the, the whole thing is that's with the crowd. As a comparison. Exactly. And, uh, and, as yeah, a comparison, go ahead. Um, we know that only three to eight percent of venture back companies have a woman mm -hmm. on their executive mm -hmm. founding team. Um, on Indiegogo, 47 percent of the right. that reach this funding yeah. target are run by women. So mm -hmm. when you level the funding playing field, that's why Indiegogo doesn't have an curation approach for an open yeah. platform. So we don't judge mm -hmm. up front. We don't decide who has the right to raise money. Mm -hmm. We let everyone have an equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then they earn the money and the promotion in a merit-based fashion. We have algorithms that do all that. Um, then uh, it shows that women, men, whatever, would do just as well. Yeah. When you well, actually give them an equal You guys collect a lot of data. I mean, this, is, this is all about what did, what did they present? What, did, what is this ladies you know, woman in, what what did they sell? What is, is high tech companies? Is makers? Everything. everything? Every, I mean, we have generally. I mean, we enable everything mm -hmm. as long as it's legal. Directors, <laughs> movies. I mean, everything from yeah, like a third of our business is creative, which is film, music. Let's have um, uh, you know, photography. A third of our business is community or cause. Everything from people raising money for their nonprofit. People raising money on behalf of a nonprofit, like when Sandy hit or the Oklahoma hurricanes or Philippines, everybody jumps on, raises money for their favorite nonprofit. It's a great can way to amplify. Please, can you hear in the back? You can't hear. Sorry. Um, and then a third of our, and then it also includes things like I just want to build an urban garden in my community, or right. I want to travel across the world, so I'm going to fund that. And then a third of our business is entrepreneurial, which is everybody from small businesses like food trucks and bakeries to high tech 
gadget designers, et cetera. So um, the breakdown, I think, is uh, 42 or 43 percent of our entrepreneurial campaigns are run by women. Um, similar, it's like 40, 45 or 46 uh, for creative, and then uh, for cause, it's 61 percent of our successful campaigns are run by women in the cause space. Good. Let me start with you here. Have you been quiet here? Tell us your opinion about the whole crowdfunding. Oh. <laughs> That's a general question, but what do well, you Well, it's, it's a general question, and I've probably looked at quite a few different deals, and a lot of uh, the entrepreneurs that come to me to help them raise money, because on a consultant basis, I've done that for about 23 years, and a lot of times they um, they say, well, what do you think about crowdfunding? What's you know, what's your opinion? And or I've tried that, and you know, and it really hasn't worked. And I think to just say it's just one of the tools in a toolbox. I mean, it's a hammer in your toolbox. There's other ways. Like I've been talking with a company. Um, uh, matter of fact, I could probably mention their name. U.S. Capital Partners and. I was pretty intrigued with the fact that we have patents for our startup, our mobile TV. And they said, well, we can, you know, loan you some money based on, you know, your patents. So that's an alternative way of funding yeah. a startup company. Another way that we raise money, I raise money for an uh, oil company, was we got a contract. It was a $75 million contract, and we needed a million and a half to build this machine. And basically, the way we did it was we gave 18% of every dollar that came out of that $75 million contract. So I suggest when you're looking at your company and how to fund it, you look at getting contracts, you look at crowdfunding, you look at um, maybe your patents, and yeah, getting they call it LOIs in a lot of <laughs> that helps too. Scott, you have some experience raising some money in the platform Indiegogo. Yeah. Tell us your opinion yeah. or your advice. Yeah, I think for the, second. I think the cool thing that no one's talked about is how it's really has a huge marketing benefit. And so every year when Ben's friends we do our patient we do our fundraiser, every year our traffic goes up fifty percent. This is we're like one of the biggest on the internet for rare disease. So like it's a huge increase in traffic. And it doesn't just come back down, it stays up 50%. And this has happened three or four years in a row. So I think everyone dwells on the financial, you know, getting money, that's great to get money. But what it really does for us as well is drive a lot of um, awareness, you know, so that people actually know about Ben's Friends, which is almost as valuable for us. Okay. Yeah. It's really, uh, Scott hit it on the head. Like, the reason why it's work, because it is work to do a campaign, <laughs> Scott would attest. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Because it's not just a funding effort, it's a marketing effort. It's also a market research effort. We have people who offer perks if you're starting a business. They offer their actual product. And they uh, test what features and pricing. You can swap perks in and out on Indiegogo. So you can try to sell at 100 bucks, then try to sell at 150 bucks. The same thing a week later and see what people fund. So it's basically an incredible way to get market feedback as to um, not just what people are saying they'd be willing to do, but what they actually do, because they're voting with their dollar. They're not just liking you on Facebook. They're saying, I'm willing to give you money. And so we, we, it's the marketing, it's the funding, it's the marketing, but it's also the market data and the feedback um, and the engagement you get out of it that makes you smarter faster. Um, and it actually allows people, on the, similarly, um, to kind of prove their market, prove their audience, which then makes them more attractive to venture capitalists. We've actually have now working with VCs that say, you know, I now tell people that if they really are interested in taking my money, go prove it that they have a market for it on Indiegogo first, and then let's talk. Yeah. Um, and then on the flip side, it allows you to fail fast. So if yeah. you can't actually work, you can't get, you, you, you fail fast at least in your messaging, et cetera, but if you can't articulate what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it, and um, have a funding goal with you know a target that you can hit, and with the ex explanation of how you're gonna use the money. I mean, it's kind of like a business plan in a box. In three weeks, you learn if you've got what it takes. And so, a lot of people actually end up failing fast, not raising much money, and that's most one of the most inspiring experiences of their life. Mm -hmm. Which is ironic because you're like, I thought you wanted to raise a bunch of money, but they realized they actually needed to tweak a lot of things, go back to the drawing board, and it, it gave them that market insight faster than any business plan or even venture capitalists could even give them because venture capitalists are just guessing about the market as well. 
Yeah, well, it's just a great uh, launching pad for products out there, a test market, we mm -hmm. call it. So basically, mm -hmm. you used to go to the Consumer Electronics Show, everybody come look, but <laughs> you know, you try it, you know, and uh, it's called uh, a rise of a pre uh, uh, launching of products, basically. Mm -hmm. That's what we call it. Mm -hmm. The whole collaboration and uh, crowdsourcing, the whole thing has come together, basically. Go try it, and if it works, right. you know, the public likes it or don't like it, you know, you go try again. But you also mm -hmm. have data. But I want to ask you a question here. Mm -hmm. Um, between all these products in Indiegogo, what did you buy? Me? Yes. <laughs> I've a lot. <laughs> really? What is your favorite? What is your favorite gadget? Gadget? Or, or you know, a cover, phone, whatever. Like it is. asking a parent what's your favorite child. And I know, but just what did you buy as as an individual? Well, one of the one of the. Ex I know what I bought, so I. Can <laughs> one of the things I refunded recently, um, which I'm excited because it just came to market, is, um, and this actually hits on. I use this example when I talk about the reasons people fund, because a lot of people think it's a purely altruistic thing on Indiegogo or a purely selfish thing. But um, our data shows that people fund for four reasons. First is passion, they just or pro the project. They just like the project itself. The second is people, mm -hmm. call them the four Ps. Project, people, they actually want to fund the team, for the people behind the team. Um, third is uh, participation. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves, so they can't quit their day job, but they'll live vicariously through this effort to be part of something. And the fourth is the perk. Yeah. Um, they want the actual thing that's being offered. So for me, the last thing I funded was this thing called the Not Buying It app, <laughs> which um, is an awesome yeah. app where you're out in the world, you see a billboard, it has super um, insulting ad because it puts women in a bad light. Yeah. Um, you take a picture of it and it automatically uploads the image, geolocates it with the hashtag to Twitter, yeah. not buying it. Yeah. So you're crowdsourcing advertising pressure to like clean up their ads and be more empowering to women. Love so, it. Yeah. I love it. I loved it too. And I funded it because I love the project. I love just the whole idea of it. I know Jennifer Newsom, who's Gavin Newsom's wife. And she's behind it. She's awesome. Um, and she's been working on this stuff for a long time, and so I funded it for that reason. Um, I funded it because I wanted to be part of cleaning up the world for the young women behind yeah. me coming up, and I funded it because I wanted the freaking app. <laughs> One other thing for the audience, entrepreneur out there, uh, Indiegogo has a great program, and you know I'm, I, have, I have disclosed here, don't have any relation or, or anything, <laughs> But they have a great app, great, great, they have a great concept about open source outposts. So they have a partnership program. Even if you have your own platform, you know, you can go to Indiegogo. So that open source, along with Linux, what's work in Silicon Valley works. So if you have, and if you have a software development, they, uh, another company, one of their partners, raised about, uh, you know, crowd bouncers, half a million dollars for the software company, just recently in Buffalo. So, I, you know, it's, it's all proud of gadget and other things for movies. So it's a great thing is happening. Let's start with the Q and A right now. Are we? Yeah. Okay. Sure. First question, and please make it short so we have everybody audience. Okay. okay. Olga. I would like to ask you: Did you ever use other platform? Like for instance, it wasn't advertised on your platform, mm -hmm. but other platform use it, like Kickstarter, for instance. What's the question? Uh, did you ever try What's the name? Product? Kick what? Uh, Kickstarter, <laughs> oh, okay. for instance, like your uh, competitors. Do I? Uh, did either. you invest or did you uh, put money into it to try maybe <laughs> their services or maybe because the company <laughs> has uh, you know. I can answer for her. It's no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <Yo. laughs> Please. <laughs> As any question? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. I think when we started, like I said, crowdfunding, the word didn't exist. We were the yeah. only people out there. And the fact that we have now thousands of platforms and websites popping mm -hmm. up, I think, is a great thing for the industry. We actually were so open that we've had other platforms use Indiegogo to raise money to launch their own crowdfunding platform. <laughs> yeah. And so that's great. I mean, I think it, sh it shows that, that the more the competitive and open a world you have, the more innovation will happen and, and it holds us, you know, honest and keeps us innovating and staying ahead. And, and then follow-up question, like, um, with the trends in the industry, uh, where do you think you will do new for your platform? Like, will be more innovative? Mm -hmm. Or what we should expect? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we're really, uh, we're really focused on is trust. And so um, we know, like, finance is built on trust. 
and I think we've in brought trust almost back to a whole new standard to finance because we've been operating a system where you invest in opaque systems where you don't know who's really running your money and now we're making fun funding far more transparent again by making it still efficient but a build, you're able to connect directly with human beings to fund what matters to you yeah. and so there's going to be a lot more we're doing around um, building trust automating trust um, making it even more easy for people to, to to trust the system and trust that when they fund something there's a good chance that the people behind it you know are going to are, are going to continue to to do what they say or at least try what try to do what they say knowing full well that funding is funding it's not buying there's no guarantee it's still funding but there's a lot of opportunity to innovate there. Around education, too, we're doing a lot around um, investing heavily in our customer happiness, uh, which is, uh, so, so I guess a lot on the trust, we've invested heavily in data science and using big data and, and algorithms and stuff like that to build a secure backend system, as well as to feed personalization and stuff like that. But then on the other side is education, which is really em empowering people, both the campaign owners raising money, as well as funders to um, uh, to be prepared to actually execute against what they want to try to execute on because it's still a new experience for a lot of people um, and then the third is just uh, continuing to innovate in products so one of the things we just launched was the outpost which is we were learning yeah. from people that they wanted to have to maximize their campaign efforts um, they wanted two things they wanted to be on Indiegogo because they wanted access to the customer happiness to our global funder base to the whole ecosystem to the trust and safety but they also wanted to take advantage of their own network on their own site, for example. And so now we offer the ability to have your campaign, a mirrored version of your campaign on your website, similar to how you pull like a WordPress blog on your website. Mm -hmm. You can now have your campaign on your website and have a mirrored version on yeah. Indiegogo, mm -hmm. so you maximize being on this ecosystem, but you also can, you don't have to send your traffic over to your campaign mm -hmm. if it's there. So that's just trying to be much more <coughs> relevant, and we'll continue to innovate there mm -hmm. and. Um, Internationalized, we're in five language, five currencies, four languages, and that'll continue to expand so that we can actually serve all international markets. And then I may add, our crowdfund beat is already in Italy with the Italian language in Germany mm -hmm. and in France, and we're going to be in Japan and nice. China. So we're believing that international yeah. evolution of our crowdfunding. We don't believe in borders. If you're yeah. a, if you're a maker in Japan who's creating really cool glasses, which there it is on Indiegogo. <laughs> you should be able to get funding from someone in America, like me, in San Francisco, who wants to see you thrive. Well, it's a, a good thing is because a lot of, you know, we, we here in Silicon Valley, we find a lot of kids, there are a lot of people coming from other countries. Now, they can stay in their community. They don't need to come there. They can get to the platform. So there's a whole a lot of evolution is happening about this mm -hmm. crowd finance, crowd collaboration. They can stay there and kind of show their project, you know, kind of access to the American market. Robert, let me ask you a question. I know, uh, you know you guys are involved because there's other part of this crowdfunding, which I'm very have interest that has to be a World Bank, community, nonprofit, for profit now because it goes to that old thing, all these nonprofit, they gotta they gotta do the same old thing that you know Paul Newman did, you know, <laughs> you know, make profit. You know, it's not that give, you know, it's not that way of giving the fish. You know, you have to show them how to, you know, fishing. So what does that World Bank do about this card? What is what did you guys do this report? You just came up with that report. What is what do you what is that all about? Yeah, well, the, if I understand the question, the report that just came out is sort of the culmination of a year's worth of research looking at uh, the emergence of crowdfunding globally. Mm -hmm. um, and the World Bank is, is really interested in the impact, uh, the impact crowdfunding can have on economic development mm -hmm. um, and economic growth and job creation uh, around the world in the developing world. And I think uh, the reason for that is, is that they, they do see it as a democratization of the access to capital. Um, capital has been so centralized. Uh, we see you know, in the US, uh, venture capital deals, I think there was less than 4,000 last year. And they're all in a few places. Uh, and they invest in companies that are, in fact, that came up in a talk earlier today. They invest within 60 or 80 miles of their offices. Uh, and if you're not in Silicon Valley or Austin or Boston or New York or Seattle, uh, even in the U.S. you don't have access, uh, let alone uh, in Kenya. So they really see it as an opportunity to, to, to get <laughs> capital flowing out for people to start businesses. Are you guys going to uh, Africa? Do you have ambitious going to Africa? Bringing... We're there. You're there? A great story is a woman um, 
She uh, taught herself to code using free online coding software. Um, got herself into a coding camp in New York. She was, I think, living in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And um, she could afford the camp, so she went on Indiegogo, raised the money to go to the camp. Um, and then went to get her, she bought her ticket and everything, and then the U.S. wouldn't let her come because she was under 18. Um, and so whenever you come to this states under 18, they think you're just going like, to disappear and stay. So her dreams were killed there, and so rather than give up, she said, well, screw that, I'm just going to start my own coding school in Nairobi. And so she went to Indiegogo to raise money to start her own coding school in Nairobi. Okay. Trish, you want to elaborate? Uh, yes. So we were talking about how you know geographically constrained it is with with BC, but you know another really important piece that we're talking about and we're hearing about all over is that you know 95.8 percent of VCs are men, 95.2 percent of deals done uh, have no woman involved at all, and and so and and that's it's not only women. It is African Americans. It's Hispanics. It's LGBT, it's anyone that's not the, the, the white guy with the hoodie, you know, for the most part. There is a pattern, you know, and I, as I said earlier, I mean, I, I, I launched, you know, the Kaufman Fellows ran it for, for almost 12 years, the, you know, put more VCs into the space than probably any, anyone else combined, and, and have a great deal of friends there, but it is a very, very narrow space. And what crowdfunding can do, it, it, which is so profound, is when it breaks it open, it's really opening the doors to groups that have not had an opportunity yeah. to green light the companies that they need to see in the world. And especially when we're looking at women, you know, we're buying 80% of the products. We have, you know, 60% of the private wealth in the U.S. Um, and, and we know where the gaps are, you know, where our passion is. You know, we, this idea that it's taken, you know, that it's, that was out there for years, you can't, you can't invest in a company unless you do 50 hours of due diligence. That is, um, those are myths that we bought into. And so the ability to enable women and others who've been left out to unlock their leverage and their influence and put that toward the teams and the products that they want to see in the marketplace and the companies they want to see succeed, what that's going to do it is almost immeasurable. Yeah. You know, when we're able to unlock that influence and see the results of that, that's going to permeate everything. And not just in the U.S., it's going to permeate things, you know, across the globe. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why I'm so excited about it. It's the last bastion for women, you yeah. know, where we're really holding, you know, grabbing a hold of our financial power and actually putting it to use. Yeah. Thank you, Trish. We just had an article, actually, if anybody wants to see it, it's about the crowdfunding would make a plain film for the woman, you know, mm -hmm. same level that we just had it in our crowdfunding. So it's very, very good. Out. So just to see. Um, Nancy, go back to your idea, then we go to Scott, then ask one question. Anybody have any question? Yes. You have a question. Go ahead. Right. Um, so yeah, we talk a lot about social and impact investing and mm -hmm. social responsibility. And, and if you look back in time, there was a lot of people that went to Africa, and that was like a traditional American thing to do. Now I, I see there's more problems locally that you can do. I have a friend, she's doing a nonprofit co called uh, Feeding Forward, and she's doing a campaign on Indiegogo right now. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, what I'm sad to see is that it's, it's not working as well as it should do. She, she, she has mer she's merging technology with that cause of like, it's, if this event has a lot of food leftover, mm -hmm. you can use her app and then say, okay, we have food leftover, volunteers come in, pick it up, and then mm -hmm. get it. Nice. Good mm -hmm. job. Great, yeah, okay. great concept, it's just that, Good so, job. Yeah. Let me ask you. Good. Let me. I want to ask you because we're short in time, and she, we, everybody has to go with it. Thank you. You have a very specific question we can answer you that. Right. I, I just uh, in terms of crowdfunding, you mentioned uh, passion, people, uh, uh, participation, and, and perks. So uh, I think you know there's uh, companies like Upstart, okay. where you invest in like successful like um, in top tier or universities, and but I think there's a, a potential within that to invest in people. Mm -hmm. It's not just their particular project right now, because in entrepreneurship, you have a first failure, second failure, and then Thank you. third, third mm -hmm. success. Anybody in the audience is a VC, I have some VC question, because this panel is about the alternative to VC angels. Mm -hmm. What sport is you? If anybody is here VC, what sport? I want to know if somebody said what sport is them, you know, if mm -hmm. any is VC. What, do you, what are you guys concerned about? I know you guys, a lot of people write down about this. Does anybody ask this question? And then VC, are you guys for it? 
I think probably VCs can concerned if people invest in the company, then they have to deal with this crowdfunders issues because who owns what in the company? And that's become an issue okay. and they have to work on it. So I don't know. And I'm going to turn do around to Scott. How going to change the result? Well, the, what the VCs are kind of a sitting outside of the, you know, what we see it as a, as a report, as somebody's researching. They're waiting outside. They, they, they don't like crowdfunding. That I found out about that because it cuts to their, you know, table basically. So, but and they have legitimate concerns. I think they I think actually do. Like I, I think that's changing. Yeah. No, but I know. But I, I can understand their concern too. But I think the industry has enough. I've seen that they are so preserved. You know, so they guard themselves about fraud, like any industry, like. And I said, it's going to be fraud. We're not going to stop it. It was fraud in the saving and loan. It was fraud, you know, the, we just had the biggest banking crash. It was all fraud. I mean, so the banks got aborted. So it's going to happen. But uh, I think I think with the way it's going on right now for entrepreneur, that is a legit, that question that I want to get is a legit question for anybody out there that they have a startup, you know, what's the secondary market? What's the equity? How are you going to determine how much this startup, you know, worth? I mean, for VC, they can spread the money and, you know, all of a sudden, bingo. But for the crowd, you're going to have, you know, they're going to invest their saving on this. Yeah. There's no secondary market. There's no uh, exit. How are you going to see that? Uh, you know, well, first of all, I think VCs do like crowdfunding in general. It's the greatest lead generation tool you could ever have. Like, Goldie Box called me one day. And I was like, what's Goldie Box? I've never heard of that. So I did a search, and they had a massively successful crowdfunding campaign. So I went to the meeting, and I was already sold. Like, she didn't even say a word to me before I already wanted to do a deal with her. So that's a very simple, great lead generation, right? Like, prove the market. As far as, like, uh, liquidity, secondary markets, like, I think it's going to be a little messy. Like, I think that the equity crowdfunding, I think the distribution, or, I think overall platforms like Angelus and some of the other ones, they will actually have a positive return. Like the average return will be positive. I think the distribution of returns will be really nasty. I think it'll be like a 90% loss rate and 10%, you know, 10% of people will make money, 90% will lose money. I think if you're doing those platforms, you absolutely have to be diversified. Like do, do not kid yourself, be heavily diversified. Angel investments, equity crowdfunding, will, you're gonna have some losses. Like believe me, I see the most promising companies in our portfolio Two years later, they're in trouble. <coughs> like it just happens. What is that? Yeah, go ahead. Wanna, yeah, I think, and that's that'll come out in education. I think it'll it'll behoove the platforms to give that education to diversify and things like that if they want to see the industry thrive. Um, but I also wanna I re recently wrote a um, guest piece uh, on this topic of how equity in equity crowdfunding actually it could become um, the best loyalty program you could ever have you know airlines credit cards they spend billions of dollars getting people to come back and use their services again well if you give people the ability to own even a tiny piece of you um, that's the best loyalty uh, ticket you can ever offer and they're actually paying you for it um, and, and where I think this will have massive impact is on the local level so maybe mm -hmm. it's the small business or the coffee shop or the local restaurant that's trying to raise money and get going. Maybe they only need fifty thousand dollars to open their doors, but if they raise the fifty from you know a hundred people in their neighborhood, guess what? Hundred people are going to come back all the time, bring their friends. Every time if somebody comes to town, they show up at their restaurant. Mm -hmm. They feel like yeah. they own it, even though they only put fifty bucks into it. Now, I just wanted to better explain. I wanted to create that commotion. VC do like crowdfunding portal. They just invested over a hundred million dollars including your company, $40 million in the public record. So they do like it. They, they, they see this thing as coming the next big thing. In January alone, they, they, they did over $100 million investment, VC. Well, well I, think there, I think it's all over. I think there are a lot of VCs that do not like crowdfunding because it is a major shift from what they're doing. I think there are a lot of lawyers. In fact, yeah. when, you know, one of the great big firms not here has told their their uh, companies that if they do a public solicitation, they will not represent them. You know, there's a lot of things, or do a crowdfunding campaign. There's a lot of things like that. So it's, I think it's really mixed. There are people like Fred Wilson, who I think is a god, you know, who has a huge number of investments in this space. Um, but I think what's going to happen is even the ones that don't like it, you want in the best deals. And, and what they are looking at is, will the crowdfunding community get only the deals that can't? get VC money, so there's going to be a, a negative connotation around it, or will they get the really great deals? 
And I think um, those of us that are, that are really focused on what our value proposition is are going to be able to grab a hold of those good deals. And then the VCs are going to come in no matter what. You know, it's going to happen because that's, yeah. that's what they have. Entrepreneurs don't need to have VCs to be successful, but VCs need entrepreneurs. VCs don't make the trends entrepreneurs do. VCs follow the trends. That's exactly right. Okay. Let me just start with you. Same question. Um, <laughs> what is your, why do the lawyers don't like crowdfunding? Do you have any? Uh, I think the same reason. You're not a lawyer, but I would ask I'm not, you I'm not a lawyer, but I've used a lot of lawyers. But the one thing that I can say is that um, anytime there seems to be an upset or could happen as an upset, if I could ask a question. Well, they make money for that. Well, they can Are make they money. Not? But the question I would have, too, is have you seen any backlash? As great as this is that goes forward and everybody talks positively, what if it's an issue you know, that says, no, I've, you know, I've, I, I now have reassessed the situation and a bunch of crowd says, I don't like this. Have you gotten any of that kind of feedback or response? Well, I've definitely, I've been talking to incubators because a lot of incubators <coughs> um, like VCs are, they see the a crowdfunding campaign as a great market validation tool data acquisition tool and um, you know gotten the feedback that when companies that eventually do want to raise venture funding they want when they do an Indiegogo campaign they they want to be successful because if they're not successful it's kind of going to um, determine whether how successful they will be at getting venture funding. Yeah. And so that, again, goes back to why we're so focused on education and empowerment, but it also means a mindset shift that, like, um, an Indiegogo campaign or a crowdfunding campaign is a way, uh, it's, it's, it's basically lean startup methodology applied to funding. I'm actually calling it lean funding, because unless you don't, yeah. it'll force you to fail fast. And so you got to be ready. And so it's, um, it's good accountability in that regard, um, but that means People don't want to fail because when you're failing, you're going to fail publicly. So that just makes the whole system better. It then makes it even more focused to do well and, and know who your, who your market is and who your customers are. Well, so one thing I, I just want to point is that, is that really what, what Danae's doing right now with the crowdfunding, I think every VC loves. It's like getting yeah. National Science Foundation money. It's completely non dilutive mm -hmm. and it does completely validate the market. So I think that's the difference in what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Let me ask you a question. We've got to start here with the final. We have only two minutes left. I want to start with you in five seconds. What's your prediction for 2000? And this is for VC. The subject is VC, alternative to VC money. You don't, it doesn't need to be a crowdfunding. What is your observation? What's going to happen this year? Crowdfunding is here. Uh, if you're asking me if crowdfunding is here, uh, I understand that's not in California right now, but as far as I'm seeing, it's here to stay. Product for another product? For the using Angel well, you know, It's kind of interesting because it's like Shark Tank. You know, okay. Shark Tank is only about products. Um, are we talking about IT? Are we gotcha. talking, you know, this is such a big, broad subject, but I'd definitely say crowdfunding right. is here. That. Scott, my prediction is Danae and Indiegogo will be on the cover of Time. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Hey, hey, I, I want to have a That's picture with all of you guys, but <laughs> so I said I was here. That's when you know you made it. Right? Publicity. Uh, I think the equity crowdfunding and the SEC will make great strides, I'm pretty sure. And I think there'll be a lot of these challenges with dilution, but they'll be worked out over time. And I think crowdfunding in general and variations on it will, will grow significantly. And we'll in five years say, can you believe we were on this dumb panel? talking about crowdfunding, and now it's XYZ. Yeah. I fully believe this is the direction, and there'll just be new models. Right. Robert, SEC, good or bad? Oh, I like <laughs> bad boys or good boys? Or well, no. <laughs> We'll see, a little bit of both. I, th I think ultimately it'll work out, uh, I think it'll work out favorably, favorably and de debt and equity crowdfunding will be just another tool available to entrepreneurs. That, yeah, one of many tools. It'll be integrated into into that product suite. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have you no question. You have to use. So I think Scott's gonna be on the cover of a Scientific American no. <laughs> <laughs> um, the model and how to use repeat campaigning as a sustainable funding model. Thank you. Um, I actually think that there. I know we just said that entrepreneurs set trends and VCs follow them. I think there's a huge opportunity, and this is my um, challenge to the VCs in the audience. Um, there's a huge opportunity for venture capitalists to actually differentiate themselves and innovate using crowdfunding. And um, you know, it's both 
what I see happening is a fund will, um, it will you know, what's, what's happening is because crowdfunding is becoming a new and alternative source of capital um, from the crowd, um, now you have multiple places you can get the cash, so cash is becoming a commodity. So what that means is now that this, you can't just be valuable by being the provider of cash, because now you can go elsewhere to get it. So VCs will have to continue to differentiate themselves as to what else can they provide beyond the cash. Um, so things like their network and resources and partnerships will be even more important. Um, and so, but I see so I see some of them innovating how they incorporate crowdfunding into their whole investment um, criteria, uh, their whole kind of how they do business, and win them winning a bunch of entrepreneurs. Market that way. validation. Well, and then they kind become, of become the VCs known you know how to use crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, let me ask you, Sandy. Is it any way that you you guys raise money? But is it anything as to do you guys become a VC or something? Some of those projects happening. Is it any plan for that? Do you see that platform structure happening like that? They they, they do something like that. Very cool. You know, we get that question all the time, and I think our mission and what our our mission is to democratize finance. Like that's why we're open. That's why we're global. That's why we don't curate. That's why we, I mean, like it is. That mission has informed our strategy. It's informed our product. It's informed who we hire. We don't hire anybody else, anybody who doesn't completely believe in yeah. changing finance. And so we're focused on being the platform that really helps the most people bring their ideas to life. And that is our goal and our mission. And I, um, you know, anything's possible in the future, but um, it's, uh, it's something, there's something that doesn't feel right in my stomach <laughs> when. Um, it's just not true to what we're what we're trying to achieve. So, and I think sticking to our a lot of people didn't get our open approach in the early days. Yeah. So it was much easier to you know try to go get really sexy campaigns and PR them and get awareness and stuff that way. But um, people are really starting to understand how the open approach is far more scalable, robust, and more equal opportunity. And I think that's starting to work work in our favor. All right, uh, let just give. Trish, you want to add to that? Crowd, the, the term crowdfunding can't even contain mm -hmm. what what's going to happen in the next, you know, three to five years. The whole financing is going to shift, and it's going to create a more enhanced entrepreneurial economy globally. And um, and we're going to see better companies. We're going to see better opportunity, and we're going to see things we never thought possible because of crowdfunding. I think it's that big. Now, if I may add, go entrepreneur woman. <laughs> And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Appreciate your audience. And uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks to me and everyone here. That was fabulous. Just before you all go, I've got a couple more books. Um, so here's the question. What percentage on Indiegogo are women? What's one of the most important benefits of crowdfunding? For a startup. Early validation. Early validation. It's like a little Wikipedia. What is Indiegogo main mission? What are they trying to do with finance? <laughs> Thanks everyone. We're gonna have Ben Tarr next.